My name is Leisha Emmons. I'm a professor of medicine in hematology and oncology at the UPMC Hellman Cancer Center. I am the vice president of the Society for Immunotherapy of Cancer and also the co-chair of CITSI's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Task Force. I am one of the moderators of today's panel discussion. The purpose of today's diversity panel discussion is to shed light on the professional and personal experience of Black and African American professionals in the scientific and medical research fields. The panel features leaders representing various career levels and medical institutions around the country. We recognize that the Black and African American cultures are varied and diverse and that our panel does not represent each culture or each individual's experience within these categories. The comments made today are not meant to generalize or represent the entire experience of all Black and African American professionals. SITSI hopes today's panel is a contribution to efforts to share and appreciate the experiences of Black and African Americans and other underrepresented communities within the scientific field as we seek to promote and enhance diversity in the clinical and biomedical research workforce. I would like to thank my co-moderator of today's panel and ask that you quickly introduce yourself. Thank you very much, um, Lisha. Uh, my name is Kunle Odunsi. I'm the director of the University of Chicago Comprehensive Cancer Center. I also serve as the Dean for Oncology in the Biological Sciences Division at the University of Chicago. Um, this is really a very important topic um, because for me, it, it ties back to the question of how do we address cancer health disparities? I think the, um, our ability to improve diversity, equity, and inclusion within the cancer workforce will really be an important strategy for reducing cancer health disparities. Um, there are also several benefits that I think um, that, that we can gain from this type of discussion. Number one, how do we engender trust of the different communities represented in our, con in our country how do we engender their trust in the healthcare system? How do we have racial concordance between patients and physicians? How do we reduce implicit racial bias by physicians? And it's really by having a diverse pool of the, in the cancer workforce, by increasing the diversity of the cancer workforce and also providing um, um, role models and mentors that we can eventually accomplish um, our goal of reducing cancer health disparities. So I am very excited about this uh, panel and um, I look forward to our discussions. Thank you very much, Kunli. Now I'd like to ask each panelist to introduce yourself. Charlie? Hello there, I am Charlie Garnett Benson um, and I am a senior scientific director um, in the translational medicine team at Bristol Myers Squibb. Um, so I'm currently the translational medicine team lead for Abdullah. Um, I really appreciate the invitation to participate in this panel discussion. I'm very glad to be here as I you know, sort of echo um, the prior comments that I think it's a really important, important topic and conversation to have. Thank you, Chelsea. Hi everybody, my name is Chelsea Pinnock. Uh, I'm an associate professor in the Department of Radiation Oncology at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas, uh, where I focus on the treatment of patients with hematologic malignancies. I'm originally from Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, I attended the University of Maryland, Baltimore County um, as an undergraduate studying biochemistry as a Meyerhoff Scholar, part of the Meyerhoff Scholarship Program there, um, and then went on to the combined degree program at University of Pennsylvania. Um, did intern year in, in Baltimore at Hopkins and then came to MD Anderson for residency and then stayed on as faculty. Um, I'm also the residency program director for our radiation oncology program um, at MD Anderson. I'm really excited to be a part of this panel. Thank you. Avery? Hello, I'm, I'm Avery Posey. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Pennsylvania. Excuse me. Uh, and my laboratory works in the development of CAR T cell therapies. I'm also a member of CISTI's Diversity and Inclusion Task Force and the Director of Diversity and Inclusion for my Center for Cellular Immunotherapies at the, at the uh, University of Pennsylvania. Thank you for having me here. Thank you. I'd really like to express my gratitude to all of you for participating in today's panel discussion. Um, I think this is a very important topic and uh, we need to pay increasing attention to the issues we're gonna discuss today. 
Based on the research we've reviewed, we see that despite the fact that Black people represent 13.4% of the U.S. population, 7% of science and engineering doctorate recipients were Black, and only 3.1% of the scientific research faculty in the United States are African American. Furthermore, between 3.9 and 6.2% of recent medical school graduates, internal medicine residents, and oncology fellows are Black, and in the highest leadership positions specifically in the field of cancer, only 2.4% of cancer center directors were Black. These data illustrate a gross underrepresentation of Black and African American professionals in science and medicine. I'd like to start this panel discussion by asking each of you to share your experiences in your professional journeys. Clearly, the four of you are success stories and truly represent what the future could be in science and medicine. Can you share a bit about your journey, why you went into science and medicine, and how you overcame some of the challenges that you faced? Dr. Odunsi. Yeah, thank you for that, for that question. Um, I went into medicine um, because of some of the um, um, people within my family and, and essentially within my extended family at the time who had various illnesses. Um, and the second reason was there was actually a role model. Um, this was um, the dad of, of a classmate of mine who at the time was an obstetrician and gynecologist. I was just impressed by um, how he seemed to know everything about everything. And um, that inspired me as a young man. So I think that begins to, and I saw that throughout my journey that you need um, role models and you need um, people to inspire you. So I was inspired at a very young age to, to begin to think about, about medical school. Um, as I went through medical school, again, during, medical, during my medical school training, I was inspired by um, um, facul several faculty members, especially um, during my OBGYN rotation. And that's how I got into obstetrics and gynecology um, for my training. Um, so my journey is a little bit different. My training was, medical school training was in Nigeria. And then I, I did additional training in, in United Kingdom um, before um, coming to the United States. But throughout all of the journey, um, I had mentors at every point, people that I could look up onto to guide and direct my steps um, because you know, you can, you can deviate at any time. So um, my experience is that 99.9% .9 of people are good people. Um, I think, I, think um, uh, I came across a lot of good people uh, who helped me to navigate the system. So when I came to the US, my residency was, was at Yale. Um, I had great mentors. The chair of my department was a great mentor. Um, um, there are other good, great mentors within the department. When I went for my fellowship at Roswell Park, um, again, great mentorship. Um, so with every step, I found that, I mean, I, I can mention him. Um, and then as a junior faculty as well, um, I had great mentorship within my institution and outside of my institution. So the key point for me, really, if I'm going to um, begin to um, talk about what, what made a difference for me, um, it's all of those people that I came across, I had the good fortune of coming across at every stage in my journey um, that guided me, that molded me, that inspired me. Um, information, I mean, knowledge is wealth. I think we, we all know that. Uh, but having access to information about what is, you know, all the options available to be able to consider options and be able to take what is, you know, the next best step for you as an individual um, is, is also very critical. Um, so it's been a, it's, it, it, it's been a great journey, um, not without obstacles. Some of the challenges include, um, um, especially as you know, when you change institution, each time um, as a as a URM, you almost have to prove yourself all over again. Um, um, which, again, with adequate mentorship, 
it's something that um, you know that that I was able to overcome um, in in many places, of course, until until you become a senior faculty. Um, so it's it's been a, a, a positive experience to a large extent um, because of the of the incredible mentors that I've had along my journey. Thank you very much for sharing that. I'm curious in your journey, you traversed several different societies and cultures, right? You started out in Nigeria and then you went to the UK and then you came over to the US. How do you think that experience has positioned you um, to really lead in terms of addressing issues of disparity, equity, and inclusion? Um, remarkable experience. Uh, when I look back at the time, it seemed to be, you know, very long process. Um, but, you know, when I look back, I find that I have um, unknowingly developed ability to interact with diverse range of interaction of, of individuals. Um, so talk about cultural competencies, um, you know, whether someone is of African or African-American background or Caucasian, European, um, British, um, German, <laughs> Um, name it. I've, I've interacted with such a broad, um, diverse range of individuals. And that helps to build the ability for interpersonal relations, which is so critical for leadership, ability to be able to um, express your views without, um, um, you know, without stepping on toes. Sometimes you have to, ability to bring people together collaboratively to work together. Um, I've been in situations where people who are diametrically opposed to each other, uh, we can bring them to the table um, and get them to work towards an aligned goal and, and mission of the organization. Um, so it's been a very useful experience. It was a long journey, um, but I tap on those experiences um, now in my leadership position. That's great. Thank you for sharing those insights. Uh, Dr. Penix? Yeah, thanks for the for the question. Um, so I think you know you touched on the data that you're providing representation, which is so important um, because you know children and adolescents and young adults they have aspirations based on their personal interests, right? But then also they have uh, and motivations. But equally important is representation and seeing people looking like you achieving the goals that you may aspire to. So. I think this emphasis and representation is really important because it truly is impactful. And so for me, um, it's always been important to me. Um, I recognized very early that actually I was often going to be the only one in the room that looked like me. And I think that was something that um, was instilled from in, our, in my family, like just getting comfortable with that and accepting that and not allowing that to be an impediment um, to taking on new challenges and forging new paths. Um, and so um, I've had an interest in medicine from as long as I can remember the pictures of me at the stethoscope around my neck during that, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up in second grade picture. Um, but I think the other exposure to science um, did not come from um, in, any knowledge that I have, but it really came from uh, mentorship. And so you've already you've kind of hit, hit on this topic already, the value of mentors. And it's really important. And for me, it was really um, essential, not just mentors in general, but especially mentors that often didn't look like me. Um, so I think the, 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 the tools that we have for overcoming challenges, um, mentorship and then being comfortable being the only one, recognizing the value of just putting one foot in front of the other, forging new paths and, and creating opportunities for those that are behind you. Thanks very much uh, for sharing your experiences. I'm curious, um, it sounds like you had a diverse group of mentors. Um, can you comment on how important you think it has to have those different points of view and different background experiences at the table to help guide you in your career journey? No, absolutely. It was very, for me, it was most impactful during my undergraduate experience, especially getting introduced to um, basic science and, and life as a scientist. And so Michael Summers, who's an HHMI investigator at UMBC, I worked in his lab um, early on. Freeman Robowski, who's one of the pioneers of the Meyerhoff program, was very influential in, in my career and aspirations. And 
And so Dr. Summers is a Caucasian male, so you know, doesn't look like me. Um, he, but he's very um, transparent and open about acknowledging that I don't look like you. I have not shared your experiences, but I do acknowledge the challenges that you face, and I want to help you navigate that. And I think that's really important. Often it's an elephant in the room. We don't talk about that, but I, I think it's really important for people to acknowledge those challenges, to talk about them openly, and then figure out how they can help you navigate around those things. So I, I would say for me, um, just being being comfortable um, finding those individuals, which can be difficult, right? Because you have to be vulnerable to be to be in that mentorship uh, relationship. Um, but those type of people are, are so important, and so I, I'm just grateful. Uh, I'm grateful to have had that throughout my um, early career. That's really great. Uh, thank you for providing that perspective, um, Dr. Posey. I think I share a um, similar perspective to uh, what Dr. Penix just mentioned. Um, so I'm a first generation college student, uh, also first generation uh, uh, grad student and on. And um, so entering college for me was an eye opener. It was uh, an introduction to many other cultures that I hadn't, hadn't experienced um, in, in earlier um, in grade school. Um, and, and that was, that was uh, I think mentioned by, by both previous speakers. Uh, important um, because that was something that I would need. The cultural competency was something I needed to build uh, for for future um, interactions along this journey in science. Um, but but another feature, another uh, component of my journey that has been important for me has been um, a support system of colleagues, um, uh, those that are peers um, who are also going through the same. Uh, points in their journey uh, or have already completed that journey. Um, so um, programs such as uh, uh, the Meyerhoff Scholarship Program in undergrad or summer research opportunities um, that I experienced at Duke University and University of Chicago were very important um, to have a cohort of similar um, of, of individuals with similar goals um, whose, whose demographics were similar to mine. We had shared experiences. I think that that uh, helps to mitigate some of the um, uh, reduced representation that we see or reduced, reduced reflection that we see later in that journey that we, we've already interacted with um, um, other individuals, Black individuals who, who are pursuing the same path and can and have networked now so that we can communicate with each other. And I still rely upon this um, as, as a faculty member. So I'm in my fourth year of my appointment and I still look to some of the um, more senior um, underrepresented minority faculty for uh, advice on um, on um, actually many parts of my career. <laughs> so I, I find that this is important uh, in addition to mentors of having having colleagues who are um, of a similar demographic. Um, and and in terms of getting here, I also agree with uh, with Dr. Penix that um, most actually all of my mentors, majority of my mentors, uh, maybe except for a few that I can name, um, don't share the same demographic as me. So I don't see myself reflected in them. Um, but one thing that has been a, a good motivator for me to, to continue along the journey and stay within uh, STEM is uh, their beliefs in me and them actually verbalizing to me. I can think of both my PhD advisor and my postdoc advisor telling me specifically that uh, they could see in me the skills that uh, that they that I would need to do this job, and and that was really a um, a, a great um, great piece of support that that has kept me kept me going. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, so you said you're the first in your family to pursue college, even. Correct. Um, I always like to think of how people embark on that road and keep striving to achieve even higher levels of education. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about your journey in that regard and how the environment around you may have changed at each at each level um, of your experience. Uh, so that's, that's a good question. Uh, so I, I, I think I relied a lot around people around me. So my, my family, my academic family started to grow um, depending upon where I was in that journey. 
Um, and in undergrad, it was really important for me to have study groups and have uh, a, a group of individuals that I could really lean on who, who kept me accountable and I could also keep them accountable. But that, that, was, that support really um, was important because I, I didn't have that same type of pressure coming from uh, home because family didn't know what this experience was like. And then that, that continues as you progress into graduate school. You have even less of a, a group of people that can rely on of how do I take this next step? So it became really important to uh, incorporate those around me as part of my academic family, um, those in the lab, those uh, uh, other who are pursuing the same, the same point in their career. Um, yeah. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Dr. Garnett Benson. So I think I'll pick up on the, the thing that you asked, sort of, you know, why we went into science. And I think for me, I've always kind of tell the story as a, a series of curious events, how I ended up where I am now. Um, but it's all kind of been on this theme of me kind of following just what I'm passionate about and what I'm innately kind of good at. So I went to an HBCU for undergrad. I went to Hampton University and I had a variety of majors initially. And my first semester, needless to say, in college was not exceptional. I was a very good student in high school and that first semester just kind of did it to me. So I honestly switched to be a molecular biology major, biology major first, because I wanted A's and I needed to improve my GPA and I knew that science and math I was good at. And so I wanted to pick a major where I could sort of improve, improve that um, GPA. I knew I did not want to go into medical school. So um, the same reason I didn't want to go and become a vet is because I, you wouldn't maybe know it to meet me externally, but I'm a very sensitive person. So I didn't think I had the emotional capability to, to, to just sort of navigate that career path. So I switched to biology. And then once I did that, I got invited to participate in a summer kind of molecular biology, one of those research programs and thought, oh, this is great. I'll stay on you know, campus for the summer. Um, get to participate and do some more science. And I was really kind of hooked in that. It, that was sort of when the light bulb went off that, you know, research was actually a career option that I could pursue and that it was really in keeping with what I was good at and what I enjoyed doing. And so from then on, I, I opted into a program called um, Minority Access to Research Careers, which is at a lot of HBCUs, and that allows you to do research um, at your institution. And then you can go away to an institution. So I went to Johns Hopkins one summer. Um, and did a research stint there and was just really hooked on research. And my senior year, I took a class in immunology um, and that really gave me sort of the focus for what I wanted my research to career to be um, related to. And, and the teacher was terrible. He literally was one of those people that removed an overhead projector line by line. But when he got to a killer T cell, I just knew this is the place I wanna be. This is fascinating. and It has all sorts of implications for health and medicine. And this would be the research field that I'm, that I'm most committed to and excited about. So I decided to then go and get my PhD in immunology from Emory University um, and had a really great um, mentor and training program there and great uh, peers as I was going through that program and knew that I wanted to apply that uh, immunology learning to cancer um, therapy, you know, for the same reasons that many other people have mentioned, you know, many family members had been uh, devastated by this disease. And I knew that that was sort of the area of health and medicine that I wanted to work in. And I wanted to apply immunology to that. And this wasn't a huge field at this time. Um, so I took that education and then went and did a postdoc at the National Cancer Institute in a cancer immunotherapy lab um, mm -hmm. focused on immunotherapy and combination strategies. And, you know, was just in love with the whole field. And it was really kind of beginning to emerge and explode at that time. So really sort of following that passion and what I'm, what I'm good at really got me to where I am now. Um, I think as far as thinking about how to overcome challenges for me, it had always just kind of be what, what worked was to just not take things personally. You know, most of the time people kind of approach you with their own, um, you know, personal experiences and a lot of time they're reacting to you based on something else and it actually has nothing to do with you as a person. And I kind of just took it on myself to find the places where I felt really comfortable and supported and encouraged to grow, right? That where I could pursue that passion and be free to do that um, and enjoy it. And that's not gonna be every space. And I just sort of took that as face value um, and just worked to find the places where I find my advocates, my supporters, my sponsors, knowing that it's not so much about being smart, you know, the smartest in the room or the brightest, that you, you really takes a village and it takes sort of a network of people um, to help you along that path. And I think you've heard that probably from, from all of the panelists. That's really great. Um, thanks for uh, sharing those experiences with, with us. I'm curious, 
how you, as you chose the different places that you did as your career progressed, how did you sort of evaluate the place in terms of the culture and the environment and as in terms of a place that you could thrive? Did you, do you have any magic formula or was it that you knew people there or how did you go about doing that? Yeah. So, so the first way that I identified was really steeped in that subject matter, right. That I wanted to grow and develop in. So that was always on, on the top of the list. Um, but as you're going through and sort of evaluating graduate programs or my postdoc program, I mean, there really is a feel, right, a cultural feel that you have when you step onto one campus versus another. And you can tell, you know, in graduate, student, graduate school, the, the faces and the energy of the other students that were there, you know, do the, the, the people, do they seem sort of exhausted and beat down and overworked? Or do they feel like, yeah, this is a lot of work. It's a hard competitive program, but what I'm working on is so exciting and everybody's in it together. I mean, you can feel that when you, when you go to a place. And so for me, I always kind of look for that. I wasn't scared of a, of a challenge or being, you know, rigor, really rigorously sort of, you know, you know, tested, but I wanted to be in a place where it was more of a feel that everybody's working together to solve a complex problem and that you were one, you know, important component of that. And it's not a, um, you know, competitive sort of cutthroat, I'm going to pit you, you know, person A against person B and whoever rises to the top. That was not of interest to me because I, I knew what I wanted to do and I knew that I needed help to get there. And so I needed to be in an environment where I felt it was a real team sort of unity effort. So I think at every place, that's really been the, the thing that I've looked for is, do you see that, that unity, um, you know, and collegiality among the people that are already there? You can kind of tell a lot. That's great. Um, thanks for sharing that. I'd like to thank all of you very, very much for sharing more than a bit about your own professional journeys. Today, we'd like to both shed light on the challenges faced by people of color and how we can all be better allies and advocates. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on what each of you and what we as a community at large could potentially do that will be impactful towards enacting change. What are some of the practical solutions that we might employ? Dr. Garnett Benson, perhaps you could start. Yeah, I think um, when you th kind of think about the stats out there, at least for me, just thinking about, you know, being in research. So, you know, upwards of 40% of women are getting the PhDs in, in science and engineering, yet only, you know, 4.6% of Black females, um, you know, comprise those, those science and engineering doctorates. And then it gets even smaller. It's down to 2% when you think about those working in the field. So, you know, it does often feel like you're, you're a unicorn um, in that space. And, you know, I think as people have said, I didn't have a lot of role models that looked like me in this field. I just knew that this is what I wanted to do and that I was really passionate um, and enthusiastic about it. So personally, sort of the way that I approach it is that, you know, those stats are so mind boggling that I try to, as often as I can, talk about what I do, talk about my research, talk about sort of, you know, the, the, the cool and exciting findings in, in, in immunotherapy research, because I do think it's one of the coolest jobs out there. Um, so I will often um, personally speak at, you know, middle schools and high schools, because I, if I had been a concept when I was in high school, I probably would have thought of it. I was always good at science and that. There's no reason why that wasn't a thought that crossed my mind until I'm trying to prepare for the GPA. And so I kind of take it upon myself that when I get an opportunity to do that, I'm always happy to talk about sort of the research that I do and, you know, what it's like to work in a lab or to lead, you know, translational research so that people can get a concept um, for what that work is like. Um, and there's often, you know, colleges that will have, you know, STEM diversity programs where they want a panelist or they're submitting sort of a broader, you know, grant application. And I'm always happy to participate, you know, and lend my voice there as either just a role model or a speaker. So personally, that that's sort of the way that I've approached it. And, you know, there's social media, so I do try to have a presence there and let people know that this does exist and that people like me are, are doing this, um, you know, and really kind of enjoying it. Um, for the community at large, I think that's a that's a harder question, right? I think the first part is accepting that there is a problem. I mean, those statistics are are pretty staggering. Um, I think that you know having honest conversations like we're having here is is a is a great first step. Um, but then kind of taking that to committing to figure out what are really the you know the sort of the core things that are leading to, to some of these. Um, disparities because it hasn't moved, right? We've recognized this as an issue for, for a couple, you know, some decades now or a decade now at least. And that needle doesn't seem to be moving as far as sort of increasing that pipeline to get, you know, people into sort of the working field. 
um, you know, in research and medicine. And so I think kind of figuring out what are some of those root causes would be, would be important. Um, and I think some of it too may require a little bit of a shift in the in the perspective, right? That working through this problem is of value to the entire community at large, right? It's not something that you're doing out of a kindness or because you feel like, you know, you want to help people that are underrepresented because it's sort of a numerical thing that needs to be fixed. Like the numbers don't match. Um, it's really that sort of valuing that diversity of perspectives is really the only way we're going to be able to tackle some of these pretty complicated problems that, you know, that we're thinking about trying to tackle or answer in the cancer immunotherapy field. And that if it's just sort of an echo chamber of the same individuals over and over again, how are you going to come up with a new innovative idea? Um, so I think some of it is, is linked to that, a little bit of a perspective change in why we're tackling this and why it's important. Um, and I do think that the programs that I think uh, Dr. Posey mentioned one as well, those undergraduate sort of research programs that are kind of focused on that diversity pipeline, I mean, they're really instrumental. Most of the peers that I know that are, you know, in my age group working in this field have all gone through sort of some sort of a research program like that, whether it's at an HBCU or, or, or a predominant majority institution. And I'm thinking, you know, in my own experience of not having thought about this in high school and younger, if there's an opportunity to sort of think about connecting, even at the high school age, if it's just the summer research experience. So those hands-on in action experiences, I think are, are instrumental to getting people to the point where, you know, we all end up sort of at this point today. That's great. Thank you very much for that perspective. Uh, Dr. Posey, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so I, I, I think in the, um, I guess time range of, of undergrad, of uh, high school to undergrad leading to graduate school um, in terms of pipelines. Um, and I, I think that um, as, as, as mentioned by Dr. Garnett Benson, um, programs that, that support uh, both cohort-based research experiences um, are really important as well as mentoring and the mentoring the mentors can come from any demographic and so as, as mentioned earlier um, so I, I think that it's it's really important for um, all of us to be considering the, the types of opportunities that our institutions and our organizations offer um, that that would help increase pipelines it uh, would help increase diversity equity inclusion for our own organizations um, we at, at CITSI have planned a uh, STEM undergrad program for the, the next annual meeting, uh, and hopefully this will this will re recur at, at future annual meetings in which underrepresented minority undergrads from the region in which the annual meeting will be held will have an opportunity to um, to visit. Uh, uh, we'll have sorry, excuse me, we'll have an opportunity to be introduced uh, to immuno oncology. Uh, we'll then be able to to see talks. Um, from leaders in the field um, and, and have an opportunity to engage with potential mentors and find out about research uh, experience opportunities uh, in the future. And, and I think that these types of, of programs are going to be really important for increasing uh, the numbers of, of students that progress into graduate school. Um, and, and those same types of cohort based programs are also being applied to faculty recruitment. Um, and, and so I think that this is a, a, a great opportunity, uh, good effort that, that will increase the number of underrepresented minorities on campus at one time. And it also provides a strong support system for those individuals. As I mentioned, like having colleagues who, who you can see yourself in and the leadership that you can see yourself in uh, is, really, is really helpful to, to installing um, in, improving your confidence in yourself, uh, your feeling of belonging. Um, those types of opportunities were really helpful for me and, and were important for retaining me along this journey in science. And that, that's really great. Uh, that sounds like a terrific program. Um, obviously, <laughs> many of us on this call have been involved in developing that. And I'm curious, what, when you talk about cohort-based programs, you've kind of got the horizontal component. You're year by year, and you also got a vertical component. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of the vertical component? Yeah, so so I personally, I have been mentored by um, many um, individuals who preceded me in, in um, some of the programs that I'm speaking of. So um, my, my undergraduate scholarship program, there were um, uh, about 50, uh, students per year 
um, 12 years prior to my arrival on campus. And, and so there's a large cohort of individuals, alumni that I can rely on and have been very helpful, including being the, uh, the, the big, big sisters uh, to me once I arrived on campus in graduate school um, and, and helping um, navigate the path that was, was really unclear to me. You know, this is a steep, for someone who's first generation, this is a steep learning curve to understand not only the discipline, but but uh, all of the other uh, things that are that are uh, not 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 clearly written um, and along the journey, and so that that's been really important to have to have uh, a, a vertical as well, not just a horizontal. That's great. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Penix. How about you? What are your yeah? Thoughts? I had three things I I wanted to touch on. Uh, one was um, examining our current processes. Um, the second thing I'll briefly touch on is moving past committee formation. And then the third thing is valuing the work. So like it's for examining our current processes, what barriers have we created, at, you know, mostly intentionally to create this problem? And I'll give you just a brief example. Radiation oncology is a very small specialty. We don't have a lot of representation early on in medical school curriculum. And so if you look at our numbers for women and underrepresented minorities have been very poor and often because it's like a word of mouth field. But not only that, what we what program directors have valued for admission have been things that were unspoken, things that were passed down from people to people. And so if you were not in that circle, you had you would have no idea. You know, and so schools that didn't have a radiation oncology department didn't know you need to do an away rotation and get a letter for someone prominent in the field. Maybe you couldn't afford to do an away rotation. You didn't know that you should maybe take a year off and do some research and get some publications. Even if you don't have aspirations to be an academic radiation oncologist to get in, you need to have those papers. All of these things are things that other people knew about, but oftentimes the underrepresented groups have no idea about. And so they're already set up to uh, be disadvantaged. And so thinking about that and changing how we, our processes, I think it's really important. And I think more people around the country are starting to think about that. I know for us, we're looking at holistic review and valuing all aspects of an applicant. And when you think about Dr. Posey, do we really think that someone that's a first generation college and first generation grad student doesn't have the grit and tenacity to figure, you know, like more so than someone that's born into a two parent household if someone's a PhD and someone's a physician and they know all about you know, thesis committees and this and that, like, do we, do we really think that the people that ha don't have the exposure but have still made it don't have what it takes to get there? Absolutely they do. They, you know, they, they're incredible people that have accomplished so much and we're inspired by them. So I think that's the first thing is to examine what we're doing and what barriers that we set up that we need to change. And then the second thing is moving past committee formation. So I'm very excited that we have this interest now around the country, around the world, especially after George Floyd and getting involved in this work and examining our society, all the things in our society that need to change. But now we have the data, right? How many papers have we seen published in high impact journals that tell us the same thing over and over again that we have to do better? So we've done that step, right? We've collected the data, but now we have to do the work. And so I think we have to move past just making committees. And we know how to do that in other aspects. Like if, we're, if you're on a committee for a board of something or whatever, you have this something you're tasked to do. And what do we do? We sit down and we make, you know, figure out what our key performance indicators are gonna be. We set timelines. We figure out how we're gonna assess our progress. We're gonna hold each other accountable. We're gonna review what we've done. And that's we have to apply that same energy and that same process to this because it can be something very simple. We can look at binary things. What have we done to change X, Y, and Z? Let's look at it in six months, Let's look at it in nine months. Why are we not moving the needle? Like, why are we not spending the same? We can't just be getting on a Zoom call and chatting about it. We have to really like do something. So that's my second thing. You can tell us feel strongly about that one. And then the last thing I'll say is um, valuing the work. So a lot of us are really involved in all these kinds of things because we really want to be and I know when I say, even if I'm tired or I feel like I'm overstretched and I'm taking things away from my, my, my husband and my kids and I get offered an opportunity to do something, I will almost always say yes, because I'm thinking about who else is gonna, like who else is a black female that's in a position to be asked to do this? So if I don't do it, then no one else is gonna do it. So, so we feel compelled all the time to, to participate even though we're stretched in. Well. I think that we can actually really engage everyone. And by doing that, 
um, we have to show that what we what we're doing really matters. So why not for promotion for you know promotion and tenure? Why don't we not just have a box that you check off like have you put on your resume some little diversity committee that you participated on? And like why don't we delve into that and figure out what details or the things that you've done? Why don't we really make that a component of promotion and acknowledge that it's important and reward it? Why don't we like okay if I'm going to travel around to go to this middle school and that person, this high school and all this, I can do that on my own time. I can do it after hours, sure, but why not say, wow, look at all the things that Dr. Garnett Benson is doing and look at how impactful it is for her to go to this middle school and to this church and this high school. So why not give her a travel stipend and give her time off to make sure she, she has time to do the work and show that we really value it. Some of our research programs take a lot of time to mentor people. Why don't we, why don't we provide something else to those mentors to show that we really care that that is important. So I think I'm going to get off my soapbox now, but those are the <laughs> three things that I wanted to mention. <laughs> that is awesome. So thank you for sharing the solutions and thank you for your passion about them as well. Um, I would like to turn this over to Dr. Odunsi now, and um, it'd be great to hear your perspective as a cancer center director. Yes, thank you. Um, I completely agree with all the things that have been said. Um, uh, Dr. Penix, I, I agree with your comments. Um, so from the perspective of a cancer center director, let me restate some of the statistics that, Lisha, that you've already um, mentioned a little bit. Um, if So there was a recent survey, more than 100 cancer centers, some of them NCI designated, some of them emerging cancer centers, and um, two, only 2.4% of directors were black, 0% um, of deputy directors black, only 5.8% of associate directors are black, only 1.5% of research program leaders in cancer centers are black. Um, but then if you ask the question, what is the pipeline that is going to lead to filling these leadership positions to be more diverse. Um, only 3.1% of the scientific research faculty in the United States are African-American race. So, so you can see the disconnect. So there's a, there's a big gap here um, for cancer centers. So I think um, the first solution is, is, the first point that I would make in terms of solution is that we have to be intentional about trying to address it. Um, we've heard about the STEM programs, um, um, but I think that is not sufficient. That, that has to be going on full speed, um, but, but we need to put together a whole lot of programs, a whole lot of things have to come together in order for us to be able to address this in a, in a, in a speedy fashion. So I am particularly glad with the introduction by the NCI to cancer centers to have a component of the cancer center support grant focused on programs for enhancing diversity. Uh, we call it the PED program or DEI program to enhance diversity within cancer centers. What does that mean? Meaning that you have to be intentional in paying attention to your, um, to your faculty composition, how diverse is your faculty composition, because again, ultimately, all of these things reflect. I mean, they 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 have something. They they they, they, they bear on patient care. They bear on ability of patients to uh, trust the healthcare system, to access clinical trials. So there are a lot of downstream consequences. So program to enhance diversity is an intentional step at NCI cancer centers. Meaning you have to. Pay, your attention, pay attention to uh, your recruitment practices, making sure you consider DEI in, in all of your recruitment practices. There's also an NCI program within cancer centers um, that is called CERTEC Education Program. And I'm sure many cancer centers across the country now have programs for high school, undergrad, college, um, um, up, up to postdocs. So those are great programs that we need to continue to um, um, conduct in our cancer centers and beyond. Um, but importantly, to pay attention to this all the time. So it's front and center, whether you're doing a recruiting 
or whether you are writing a grant, whether you are, you know, even your grants. So there are grants by the NCI for uh, minority um, um, postdocs or minority undergrads or, or junior faculty, taking advantage of all of these opportunities. The second important um, potential solution or, or proposal um, for us to consider is, um, um, is provide opportunities for leadership. Um, so again, I, I, will, I will call out um, AACI, American Association um, for Cancer Institute, of Cancer Institutes, um, um, and other bodies who are, who are initiating leadership programs. Um, so it's important for us to take advantage of leadership training programs um, that are being conducted um, in the cancer field so that we can have more um, encourage our um, underrepresented, underrepresented minorities to participate um, in this program to prepare them uh, for leadership positions. I've talked about the NCI awards. There are other types of grant mechanisms for um, fostering um, um, the career development of underrepresented minorities, some from AACR. I, I think CITSI has some awards to encourage uh, um, uh, URMs to to attend the CITSI meetings. Um, um, so all of these things have to be, you know, have to be going on in, 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 in full force. We've talked about cluster recruiting. Um, this, some institutions are doing, some are doing it better than others. Um, this requires very careful coordination where you can recruit a cluster of URMs so they provide support for each other. And also you arrange for proper mentorship. There are all kinds of mentorship, like real mentorship um, is an investment. It, it, it's an investment of time. It's an investment of energy. And so identifying um, mentorship for different roles among existing faculty. And um, again, for, from my own experience, um, just like others, 99.5% of my mentors um, do not look like me. Um, so, and that's why I say there are, there are great people out there that do not look like you and just leveraging all opportunities. A mentor doesn't have to look like you. There are people that, that, that are committed to this, that are passionate about this on different faculty across the nation um, that can actually mentor underrepresented minorities. Um, so those are some of the solutions that I, I thought, uh, you know, from the perspective of a cancer center director, how we can accelerate um, um, and, and really try and reverse those numbers where only 2.4% of directors are black, 1.5% of research program leaders in cancer centers are black. Um, that, and that does not reflect the proportion in the general population. Well, it doesn't reflect the talent or opportunity out there either. So um, we need to find ways to best engage folks um, to be part of the community. So I think we've uh, talked about strategies and within that discussion, we've talked about um, tools, tips, and had some words of encouragement as well. Lots of passion as well. So I think uh, we're gonna conclude the panel discussion. I'd like to thank all of you very much um, for participating and sharing your professional and personal experiences and suggestions for how we can move the needle towards impactful change. I'd also like to thank all of our viewers and I hope you found this panel discussion informative and enlightening. As we learned today, there's still considerable room for progress to be made across the board. And I will make sure that CITSI continues to identify avenues and mechanisms that bring new opportunities to further diversify the field. We very much look forward to continuing these conversations in the future and hope that you will too within your own networks. Thank you again very much for joining us today.